I guess maybe uh, turn with me to St. Mark's Gospel. And St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, it is. And considering chapter 10 and wanting to preach from verse 28 uh, to verse 31, but it would be remiss if I didn't give you the context at least of the text. And on August the 9th, on a Sunday evening, Dr. Swift, I'm going to do that homiletical piece for all ministers. Uh, I think it's August, or did I say September? Uh, one of the months. Uh, but I think the earlier the better, the quicker the better. August 9th. All right, August 9th. And we'll come in at 5 on a Sunday evening, and then we'll uh, work until into service, do the, hom uh, the, the homiletical piece. It would be remiss to approach it like this and not give a sort of panoramic view of what leads Jesus to say what he's going to say here. So it actually begins in about verse 17 when the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said to him, Good Master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Uh, Jesus has a way of playing on words. If you've studied him closely in his conversation, he plays with words in order to stimulate and to, yes, upset the equilibrium. He plays with words. Uh, one place where the scribe came and looked over his little group and saw that he didn't have anybody who was uh, spectacularly qualified because they were all fishermen and, and the scribe said to Jesus, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said, the birds of the air, air have nests, foxes have holes, that comes first, the bear, bird of the air have nests, but I, the son of man, hath no whithersoever to go. I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest, I have no whithersoever to go. So in other words, will you follow me when I'm going nowhere? Or are you following me simply to further your career? Amen. Uh, can you come to the meeting when you're not in charge? Can you sing background even though you've got a great lead singing voice? Amen. Can you listen to someone else preach even though you are uh, a spectacular preacher? You know, I mean, can you ride in the back seat even though you know how to drive? Will you follow me when I'm going nowhere? When somewhere is nowhere will you still be there? Uh, and then of course the man who brought his son to Jesus, uh, brought rather brought the son to the disciples, they couldn't heal him. And in his pain, when Jesus asked him, how long has this been going on? He said, since he was a child. He says, but now if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us. And Jesus played on the word anything and said, if thou canst believe all things, are possible. Now, in this case, he's going to do it in another way where the man says, good master, and Jesus immediately asked him, why callest thou me good? Are you calling me good because you're flattering me? What do you want? Or are you calling me good because you know I'm God, because only God is good? Are you willing to accept that there is none good but one that is God. And if you're calling me good, are you accepting the fact that I am God? He said, well, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And asked to Jesus, jab him. Then Jesus said, you know the commandments and all the things Jesus spit out. And, and he said to Jesus, I've been doing this since I was a child. And Jesus said, I tell you one thing you haven't done, and that is, uh, you go and sell whatsoever thou hast and give it to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven mm -hmm. and then come take up the cross and follow me. See now Jesus wasn't taking it without a return. Jesus says now you sell all you have, give to the poor and now we'll transfer what you have to treasures in heaven. 
And the rich young ruler went away grieved because he had much possession and he couldn't understand how he was supposed to do that. Now Jesus turned and said to his disciples now in 23, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and saith unto them, children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. Thank you. See how quiet it is? Yeah, looking nice in here. Because uh, you're messing with my money now. Uh, right. Messing with my stuff. I thought the Lord would have a lot of stuff. See, if you notice, there's a difference in 23 than in 24. Because 23, Jesus said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And immediately they were astonished. Because they figured now, if anybody ought to make it, it ought to be somebody with some money. But Jesus turned around and said, and he qualified what he said in a very subtle way. He said, how hard is it for them that trust in riches? It's not really what you have, but how you feel about what you have. And what you have and how it messes with you, what you have. Mm. Oh Lord. And they again were stunned out of measure, saying amongst themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. That is, making you rich and you still have the right attitude. Mm -hmm. And you not be affected. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive an hundredfold. Now in this time, houses and brethren and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, but he left out wife. Let me see. House, brethren, sisters, father, mother, wife, children, lands. I, but now you're going to receive a hundredfold in this time, houses, brethren, sisters, mothers, children. Lord have mercy. <laughs> and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. But many that are first shall be last and the last first. I want you to look at somebody with all the ebullience that you can muster and tell them you have to give something up. You got to give up something. Now look at somebody else and ask, what are you willing to give up? Or maybe we ought to ask, who are you willing? <sighs> it is interesting, the, the, and others are coming in. It is interesting how so often the Bible seems to be contradistinctive and antithetical to not always have a consistency when you approach it on the surface. In another text, in Corinthians, he, 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 he literally says, all are yours. And it's interesting when it seems uh, that he's dealing with sacrificial suffering that is being transformed or transferred rather from, from Christ to us. Where somewhere within the operation of salvation, whatever Christ did for us, he's expecting us to exemplify what he did for us by doing it for others. 
it's, it's actually the uh, duplication of the benefactor in the recipient. And it completes the transaction because what it says is that I have been wonderfully blessed to the point where I have to bless somebody else because I can't be so wonderfully blessed and not bless somebody else. Uh, I feel it. It's a, uh, when, when I think about uh, a couple of previous thoughts that I've had as it relates to this, the, the greater the sacrifice, there is no question the greater the pain or the greater the joy on behalf of the benefactor depending on how the recipient responds. Uh, I oftentimes find, and maybe you have found it in your life, that you can have plans for somebody and you can want things for somebody uh, who doesn't want it for themselves. Uh, and, and it's rough to be in any kind of close and intimate relationship whether it's your children or whether it's a significant other, uh, that you could ever want something for them and you're willing to sacrifice for them to have it, but they don't want it for themselves. And so the greater the effort you put in it to bring them off the ground and the more they resist it, and continually devalue what you do in order not to appreciate it is the greater you feel pain. Uh, on the other hand, if they respond to it and they operate with the parameters of what you have done and part of showing you respect for what you have done is doing something with what you have done. Uh, uh, okay. uh, I'm not going to keep you all day. I, I can get through in a minute. Uh, the, the pain comes when your sacrifice has been abused. Uh, when, and joy comes when it has been appropriated. Uh, because oftentimes, I'm not just doing this for me. Uh, and many times, uh, one of the greatest gifts to ever give is a gift that can continually bless the recipient after the giver is gone. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm going to work this. Uh, this now is, is for you, and to embody the gift that I'm about to give is not for me, because this gift will operate when I'm gone. You know, there, there are certain people who don't give like that. Uh, they give what they can share in. Uh, can, 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 I, can I just preach like I said? Uh, it's my birthday, so we're going to dinner. Mm, but you're going to eat with me too. So maybe my birthday was an opportunity for you to go to dinner with me. And, uh, and you're getting something out of the dinner. Why don't you take the dinner money and give it all to me? <laughs> Amen. And then that gift would be mine. Uh, there are certain gifts we give that we share in, but there are other gifts that we give that we will not share in. Uh, our children, when we sacrifice to give them a college degree, and for much of it we share, but for time when we're gone, they're still operating in the gift that you have given. Uh, there is fulfillment that comes then from giving. I am finding out that Moses, for instance, and it, it really, it, it's really quite a, a task to understand God. Because Moses did not want to go. He did not want to go. He kept complaining about not being able to speak. He had uh, some trepidation about Pharaoh. He certainly didn't want to deal with the knucklehead people he had because he had killed uh, Egyptian.